author of three books. Diane has a long career in human services and is now working at Unity House in Troy. She's a passionate teacher of family caregivers and to people in recovery. She is married to David Pescone. They live in Gildal in New York. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision, and today, well lived, makes yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, this, therefore, to this day. Frankly, I am finding this time locally and in our nation to be very difficult. The coronavirus has disrupted travel plans and daily life. Summer storms have caused havoc locally, nationally, and worldwide. The upcoming presidential election is perhaps even more disruptive, especially within families where individuals are approaching the situation from such different perspectives. Let us take this time together today to breathe deeply, think calmly, and feel that our love for our family and friends is more important than our political convictions and our fears. Be safe and be well. Please join me in the chalice lighting with the words that you find on the screen. Welcoming all free seekers of truth and meaning, we gather to excite the human spirit, to inspire its growth and development, to respond morally and ethically to a troubled world, and to sustain a vital and nurturing religious community. Our first hymn this morning is When I Am Frightened by Shelley Jackson Denham. And it's presented by the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. We'll sing along with them.
We enjoy welcoming guests and visitors to our service. If you are a guest or visitor and would like to tell us who you are and from where you're from, you may click on the blue raise hand symbol in the participant window. Our technician will unmute you and invite you to speak. You may also, or instead, click on the visitor link you'll find now in the chat window. We have one, uh, Paulette, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Paulette Slattery. I'm currently in Lenox, Massachusetts, soon to be moving to Del Mar and looking forward to connecting with the UU uh, church there, hopefully in person soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, welcome, welcome. Anybody else, Chris? I think that's it for the moment. Okay, well, thank you and welcome. If you'd like to learn more about uh, our congregation or about Unitarian Universalism, find someone with membership for their name in the participant window. You can reach out to that person in the chat window now or after the service. You can also at any time connect to the visitor link or get more information about our congregation from our website, www.albanyuu.org. We welcome the chance to greet each other. In our Zoom format, this is done through virtual breakout rooms. You can say hello and share your name, and this time will last 90 seconds, and then we'll all come back together. Hello again. This is the time set aside in our service for sharing significant personal milestones in our lives. If we were in community hall, you would be invited to come forward. Okay, bye bye, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Can we start over again? I will. This is a time set aside in our service for sharing significant personal milestones in our lives. If we were in community hall, you would be invited to come forward to move a stone. 
If you would like to share your joy or sorrow with us, there are still several ways you can do that. You may raise your blue hand in the participant window if, you, if you'd like. Let's see. Or um, you can ask, you can, somebody can, and somebody can move it for you. I'm missing some part of my script, I'm sorry. All right. I have a sorrow from uh, uh, the shared from us from Sharon Babylon, and that is that Thayer Heath is in Ellis Hospital with fluid in her lungs. Ooh. So keep her in your thoughts, please. And we're moving on. Um, Fred has, Fred Eames has a concern or something to share with us. Go ahead, Fred. Oh, oh all right. Yeah, I, I, I tried to connect last week, but I was not home, so I only had my cell phone and didn't connect very well. But if I had, I would have told you that on last Sunday, I was uh, celebrating the beginning of my 73rd year. All right. <laughs> very Wonderful. Day. Okay. All right, at this moment, there are no other raised hands, so we'll move on to the chat, the concerns and um, shared in the chat, chat window. Ah, okay. Well, I don't see anybody say read aloud. I think that part of the script was missed. If anybody has anything they want read aloud, if you can type it in the chat at this point. And, um, but I do see, and I'm gonna read it anyways, that um, Sherry has a sorrow. Her friend Clara's father passed away last week and she's in Detroit keeping her company through this sudden tragedy. Very sad. Uh, let's see. Ashley Keegan is. Mm, I'm stuck. Ashley Keegan said, so, was looking for something. Yeah. Um, so Ashley says, after two years, they finally settled their teacher's contract at her school. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> How exciting, especially in this time. That's great, Ashley. And um, Jan McCracken didn't say read aloud, but since we don't have them, oh yes, Jan's missing her dear friend and congregant, fellow congregant, Linda Monroe, who passed away a year ago. And I, that is all I see at the moment, Chris. Great, thank you. Oops. Thank you. Um, so let us hold all the joys and sorrows that we've heard and those that remain unspoken in our hearts. And as we, as we carry all of those thoughts and move toward a beautiful meditation with Randy, I invite you into this period of silence with these words. And now let us enter with greater intention into rest for our hearts. Let us breathe in the calm that holds us all. Let us breathe into the mystery that is in us and around us. Let us pause, let us listen, and let us touch the wisdom of the ages.
this reading from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The tide rises, the tide falls, the twilight darkens, the curlew calls. Along the sea sands damp and brown, the traveler hastens toward the town, and the tide rises and the tide falls. Darkness settles on roofs and walls, but the sea, the sea in the darkness calls. The little waves with their soft white hands efface the footprints in the sands, and the tide rises, the tide falls. The morning breaks, the steeds in their stalls stamp and neigh as the hostler calls. The day returns, but never more returns the traveler to the shore. And the tide rises and the tide falls. An important way we celebrate life each Sunday is by offering an opportunity to pra practice generosity. Members and friends support our congregation with an annual pledge paid throughout the year. Another way to support the good work of this congregation is by making a generous donation via one of the options shown on this slide. There it is. You can click on the tiny URL link in the chat window to donate, or you can send a text to the number shown on the screen. The examples on the slide show how to label your text to indicate the amount and the purpose or intent of your gift. Our offertory. Oh, Randy, absolutely perfect. The perfect song. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with all of you in Zoom in Albany in our lives, in a whole new world, absolutely. It's Labor Day weekend, and it's my favorite holiday weekend. At Labor Day, we think about the start of a new year, a time to consider a new direction, making new plans. We've always done that, and again this year. But this year more than ever, you have seen the jokes and the memes Many of us cannot wait to leave 2020 behind. After months of so much change in our lives, so much disruption and worry, we are right to ask, what is new and what never changes? So what never changes? The foundation for the future tells us that some things are unlikely to change over the next many years as they have not changed over the past many years. And it starts with pencils. In 1565, a Swiss physician, Conrad Gessner, described a pencil as a writing rod in a wooden case. And since then, changes to pencils have been very slow, adding an eraser, putting some paint on it to prevent splinters, and then finally making a flat side so it wouldn't roll away from us. Pencils basically don't change. Also books. Yes, we have tablets and screens, but books have 500 years of inertia behind them. They are stable and they are durable. During COVID, we know lots of people went to Kindle, but interestingly, more people bought more books during this time, this past number of months. The other thing we did during COVID was eat a lot. We made bread or our friends gave us bread. We cooked lots of things. So we also know that eating utensils have hardly changed at all. In 1611, Thomas Poirier brought forks, this amazing invention of fork from Italy to Britain and promoted their use. He was ridiculed. It was considered effeminate to not eat with your hands. He had this new thing. 
but today a knife, a fork, and a spoon constitute the food dispatching system. Traffic jams are not going to change. Flying cars will not get us out of the jam. Cars will still, with a driver or no driver, roll along the ground, and congestion will remain a fact of life. And speaking of facts of life, sex. Even with cloning and in vitro fertilization and gene manipulation, the real deal will remain the dominant reproductive interface. That's the best way we can say that. Um, but also baseball. Think about this. The players have gotten bigger. Loyalty to cities and towns has waned since the very early days. And other sports are taking a bite out of the sports viewing pie. But baseball will go on. It will absolutely go on. But here are a couple more things that will not change. These are a little more serious and things uh, we want to examine maybe a little more closely than baseball and pencils. Number one, you can't please everyone. Seriously. And even though I know this, I have to relearn it over and over again. Trying to make other people happy is thankless and it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting. That won't change. We need to examine that. Number two, we are not going to live forever. And you would think that we would really get this in the time of COVID, right? Look at those numbers. Look at, look at the medical information that we get. Unfortunately, death is a sure thing. So we have to take care of ourselves and we have to live as if we are going to die. Who remembers Carlos Castaneda? I give away my age when I tell you that I am of the age when most of us had his book on our bookshelf right next to be here now and steal this book. That was a certain picture of a certain time. Carlos Castaneda told us, live with death on your shoulder. Consult death right here every day for every decision, for every choice, for how you will spend your lives. But then we got married, we had jobs, we had kids, we bought houses, we got better looking bookshelves, those boards and bricks got to go finally. And the weight of the world replaced death on our shoulder. But really, we're not gonna live forever. And that is not going to change. Number three, You'll never catch up with the Joneses. Now, I realize you're Unitarians. You are not competing for material things. We understand that. But maybe you might be tempted to compete for great experiences, great travel, uh, meaningful things, spiritual experiences. So still be careful. That sense of competition catches all of us, even the most spiritual. And that never changes. Beware. But number four, here's the biggie. Holding a grudge is never going to have the effect you are hoping for. It doesn't change. Not if it's family or social or in a workplace. Resentment only hurts one person. Me, right? Or you. You've heard the reminders. Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Or my absolute favorite, resentment is like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. That really, that one brings me back every time. But you are the only one who gets hurt by holding a grudge. And that doesn't change. And so that invites us to do our spiritual work, of course. But here we are in the midst of coronavirus time. Things must surely be different now, right? This is extraordinary. But no, this is a very hard time with lots of challenges. You can name a half a dozen as I can. We have so many, so many challenges. We have many of the challenges in common, but we each, there are some that are unique 
to each of us. Some of us have to negotiate spending too much people, too much time with the people in our houses. And others have to face the feelings of being alone because they don't share their space with anyone else. But what we know about both of those groups is they both face loneliness because just being with people does not guarantee feeling loved and connected or eliminate feelings of loneliness. The thing we most want is to be seen and to be known. And interestingly, while we might see a lot of people on Zoom, thank goodness for Zoom in many ways, we also know Zoom is exhausting. And there is a neurological reason and a neurological impact for why that is. We don't actually see each other on Zoom. Here we are, we're looking at our little boxes right now and kind of feeling like we see each other. But in order for Zoom to work, it has to remove so many data points and so many pixels that we are actually seeing less than 60% of what we would see if we were in person. And all the subtlety of body language, all the subtlety of the physiological is removed. So that's why we're so tired. Our brain is struggling, whether this is for business or for school, for worship, the brain is constantly struggling to reconcile what it thinks it sees, what it wants to make of that, what, um, how will it fill in the partial image? Imagine it's the, what the brain has a little bit of like dots and outline of a person and it keeps trying to fill that image, fill that image and make sense of it and then reconcile what it knows of that with a person and a face. And that's a huge challenge. It's the blessing and the challenge of how we're getting through this time. Um, but what if, here's what I, I invite you to ponder today, to think about today. I'm gonna give you a question. Take this to your conversation after the service. Take this to your socially distanced lunch this afternoon on somebody's backyard or somebody's porch. Take this to your, your very good friends. This question, what if the coronavirus challenges are not happening to you, but they are happening for you? What if the coronavirus challenges are not happening to you, but they are happening for you? And what are those that are happening for you? Powerful question. So what do we do? What do we do in this time of things changing and not changing? Here is a story from the Colombian novelist, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Somewhere in a time much like ours, a father is working in his study. He is struggling and worrying and trying to solve the problems of the world. When his little boy comes in and says, Daddy, I want to help you do your work. And the very weary father, he appreciates the little boy's gesture, right? But he feels like his son is a hindrance and a distraction, of course. But the little boy persists, as little boys will do, little girls will do. So the father, to distract his child, he picks up a magazine and he tears out a picture of the map of the world. And he tears it into lots of little tiny pieces. And he says to his son, I know that you like puzzles. So take all these pieces and you put them back together. Put the world back together. That's how you can help me. And his little son is so worried and he says, but daddy, I don't even know what the world looks like. And the father says, nevertheless, this is what I would like you to do to help me. You go put this puzzle back together and make, make the world come back together. And he sends him off and the dad is thinking, this will keep him busy for a couple of days, keep him out of my hair. And the father goes back to his very weary work of worrying about the world. And the next day, the son comes back into the study and he says, he's very excited, Father, I did it. I put it back together. And sure enough, he shows his father 
He took all the pieces and he had taped them back together and there was the perfect picture of the world. His father's absolutely stunned. This is a little tiny boy. And his father says, how did you do that? And the boy, very eager to show him, he turns over the map of the world and he says, on the back was a picture of a person. I put the person back together and when I turned it over, the world was all back together. That profound wisdom is what we can borrow for our world-weary problems right now. When we put ourselves back together, we are helping to put the world back together too. That never changes putting ourselves back together, helping our loved ones put themselves back together is the great work. That is the great work. It's also what we mean by transcendence. In spiritual terms, transcendence is the ability to go beyond the confines of the world and the immediate problems of our daily lives and to open ourselves to the greater reality of the world and our place in it. And that is where the spiritual meets the mundane. The spiritual meets the tragedy. The spiritual meets the weariness. So what is new, what never changes, and what can we hold on to? What do we hold on to? During the bombing raids in England, during World War II, thousands of children were orphaned and left to starve. The fortunate ones were gathered up. They were placed in orphanages where they received very good care. They were fed and loved and helped. But these children who had lost so much could not sleep, perhaps like many of us right now. The caregivers tried everything, games and dolls and toys, more play outdoors and fresh air during the day, cozy blankets at night and night lights and lullabies and music, but still the children could not sleep. Until finally, almost accidentally, they stumbled on the idea of giving each child a piece of bread to hold at night when they tuck them in. And holding their little piece of bread, the children finally slept. They were no longer afraid to wake up hungry again, fearing that the next day would bring what they knew from their, their past. Holding their bread, they could feel peace and not fear the next day. And this is what we need now to hold on to what never changes. Community, the spirituality in our life, our, our baby steps toward transcendence, so that we can face what will certainly be new again tomorrow. I thank you. That's such an amazing song. I love it. Thank you, Randy and Chris. As we extinguish the chalice, please join in the word shown on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. With what benediction shall I leave you? This, in your life may you know the holy meaning and the holy mystery that breaks into it every moment. May you live at peace with your world and at peace with yourself. And may the love of truth guide you in your every day. Amen.
course, this service never is a solo business. It takes a lot of people to do this. So our thanks to Chuck, the ushers, Chuck Manning, Don Dana, Dick Dana, Don O'Dell, our pastoral care associate, Randy Rosette. Our welcomer was Barb Manning, musicians, Randy Rosette and Chris Jensen. With office support, we thank Sapphire Korea, technical support, Chris Jensen. And our summer service coordinator is Randy Rosette.